I want to pick up where we left off yesterday, day two of Diddy and the shocking truth about hip hop. Uh, it made me think yesterday's conversation about a video, a spoof that I saw on the internet. It came from the Jimmy Kimmel show. It, it featured, let's, I think we can play the clip or, you know, we won't play the sound, but it featured Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, 50 Cent. Eminem was in it as well, but Dr. Dre, Snoop, and 50 Cent did most of it. And it featured, it was on Jimmy Kimmel's show. And I'm sitting here looking at three of the biggest brands in hip hop, three of the allegedly most uh, masculine brands in hip hop. Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, and 50 Cent. And the spoof is them staring at, meat gazing Jimmy Kimmel. And, and there were parts of this spoof, the second half, that I found humorous and funny. But the first half of it, with three rappers that are supposed to be the epitome of masculinity, they're gangster rappers, they're tough guys, they're this, and they're playing this role of doctors and, try, and examining Jimmy Kimmel's private parts. And, and it made me think of yesterday's show, where I told you that, that these rappers, these millionaire, and billionaire rappers. They don't have F you money. They have F me money. And, and I talked to you all yesterday about the difference between F you money and F me money and how we all have this perception that, oh man, these rappers and, and these athletes and these super celebrity icons, man, they got so much money, they can do whatever they want. They got F you money. And I'm like, no, they don't. They've been given F me money so that their puppet masters can tell them what to do and can screw them over and or bend them over whenever they want. Because if you have FU money, if I'm a billionaire, there are certain boundaries I draw. There's lines in the sand that it's like, nah, I ain't doing that. I'm good. I'm worth a billion dollars. I'm worth $300 million. I'm worth $500, $100 million, $40 million. Five, I'm worth $5,000. I ain't doing that. I know you want to do your spoof. I know you want three dudes sitting here uh, meat gazing you and it'll be funny and you can pretend to be self-deprecating Jimmy, but I'm good. I'm a billionaire. I'm a multi-millionaire. Isn't that what F you money is supposed to do? That you can draw lines in the sand and say, there's certain things I'm not going to participate in. That's beneath me and my station. Dr. Dre has got to be my age. Snoop is close to my age. 50 cents has got to be close to 40. When do these guys draw lines in the sand? When do they set up boundaries and say, nah, that's for somebody else. I'm a billionaire. I'm a multimillionaire. They don't do it because they don't have F you money. They have F me money. They were given that money as a way to control them. We're going to pick up again today on Diddy and the truth, the shocking truth about hip hop. Part two starts now. Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Friday. Thanks for making it through the week with us. Uh, we're going to wrap up the week on a very strong note. Uh, I, I, I went really big picture uh, yesterday because I wanted to lay the groundwork for you to have a full understanding about Diddy, his role in hip hop, his role in American culture, his role in global culture. 
we went really big picture yesterday, and we're gonna stay big picture. There, there's, we ended the show talking about nihilism, and, and I want to expound on that, and then we're gonna zero in on P. Diddy, and then I'm going to transition into something really fascinating, something really interesting about Tupac Shakur, and, and connect the dots about the history. I'm gonna bring Tupac Shakur and the Beatles <laughs> into my conversation about Diddy and what's going on with hip hop. You gotta stay tuned and stick around and hear. This is gonna be better than yesterday. But just stick with me, be patient as I lay the groundwork. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my code FEARLESS to get a free $119 Heritage Ham plus $25 off any box with your subscription. Today's theme is Agents of Nihilism. Agents of nihilism. This isn't about agents of chaos. This is about agents of nihilism. I want to reset for you all the definition of nihilism. I, 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 I want to reset that. And, and I, again, I don't want to be talking down to you or pretending like you don't remember or you don't know the definition. But I just want us all to be on the same page because it's very important. Nihilism is the rejection of all religious and moral principles in the belief that life is meaningless. This is where they have us headed. This is where they're trying to, re uh, to direct us. They want a nihilistic culture, and we see examples of it everywhere. Because again, a rejection of all moral and religious principles in the belief that life has no meaning the other half of that, because again, when you reject all religious and moral principles, what you're really talking about is a dumbed down society. And as I told you all yesterday, what they've done with hip hop music is they've promoted prison culture. Where's the most nihilistic place on the planet? It's inside a prison. Everybody there is a predator. Life has no meaning. There's nothing to look forward to. There are no uh, uplifting values or principles that people are adhering to. It's men and or women preying on each other. And they've used this music to normalize and to mainstream prison culture and prison values. Everything you see from the, all the tats that guys wear, Oh, the white t-shirts, the, the pants hanging off their butts, all the conversation. We, we heard it yesterday from uh, Ice-T about who he was making rap music for, for the penitentiary. We heard it from Ice Cube breaking down how the same people that own the private prisons own the music industry. We heard it all. There's a push for nihilism. And, and I explained to you all how uh, the globalists, the, the people, the Black Rock, the vanguards, the, the, the elites, this isn't really about money. The money's nice that they make in hip hop and the prison industrial complex, but this isn't about money. This isn't about an agenda, a global agenda. A, a, a shift in global culture and a shift in how uh, the elites and how they want the world to run. Technology and robots are running human beings out of work. They want, they want to devalue freedom. And they have devalued freedom. And again, when you're in prison, you have no freedom. You get used to not having freedom. You get used to being told, you're gonna eat this slop, you're gonna eat it at this time, you're gonna go to bed at this time, you're gonna wake up at this time. If we wanna inject you with something, we'll do that. You get used to not having freedoms and rights. Your rights are no longer God-given 
when you're in prison, their man and government and warden given. Or whatever gang has its hooks into you. They're normalizing a nihilistic worldview. And just think about what I'm saying and how it relates to prison. How do people organize the majority of people organize inside a prison? They organize by tribe, by color tribes. The whites gang up, click up together. The blacks gang up, click up together. Uh, the blacks gang up, click up together. What are they doing to American society? with this dumbed down, nihilistic music and the people influencers. Are they not baiting us to click up, gang up in these little racial tribes? Are they not pro promoting that sort of racial division? I, I, I wanna show you about like, the power of, of what the music industry is doing and how it all connects to just this dumbing down of society and culture. Last night or, or the day before on CNN, they brought a woman who calls herself Glorilla. Glow, G-L-O, Rilla. A woman that's calling herself basically a gorilla that's a rapper, they brought on CNN to talk about being invited to the White House. And so, first of all, the fact that she was invited to the White House by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris says a lot. It says a lot about, hey, what is going on here? A woman that's calling herself a gorilla, a black woman who's calling herself a gorilla is getting invited to the White House like she's important. This is not by accident. This is them using the culture that they've created, using the music industry to push a level of idiocy that's just unprecedented. A rapper that calls herself Gorilla, Glorilla, is invited to the White House Here's CNN, and I, I should have taken the time to look up the name of this host because she's just as dumb as this woman calling herself Gorilla because she's interviewing this woman as if she's a serious person and she's trying to build up this woman's credibility and legitimacy. My mind is blown. Both of the, these are two idiots talking back and forth to each other. Play the clip. How popular you are how talented of an artist you are, how many accolades and nominations and everything you've got going on, at least, at least with what you have planned for the summer coming ahead with um, a concert and a tour, the idea of them inviting you there in particular, um, did they talk to you about what they wanted politically? Did they want your endorsement? Did they want you to help people get out the vote? <laughs> Hey, you know, they ain't got nothing to do with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just living my life like it's golden, living my life like it's golden. But, you know, I'm not going to, you know what I'm saying, talk politics, but I love the president. You know what I'm saying? I love everybody. And at the end of the day, the day got to end. Gorilla there, or Glorilla, is from Memphis, Tennessee. She's part of that Memphis Southern rap crowd. She... Her, her most popular song, and, and I'm sorry for telling you this, but I, I don't, we won't play the audio, but, but we'll play the video, and I'll tell you the name of the song. F-N-F. -F. Uh, I think it stands for <laughs> F-N-I free. Bleep me out as I say this, free. That's the name of the song. And it's her and six, seven, eight other girls out in the street dancing around, pouring liquor down each other's throats, slapping each other's butts, flashing cash, smoking weed. Her song, and bleep me out as I say this, 
And, and you know, maybe we can, somewhere I will put the words of just to get free. She's on CNN. She's at the White House. As if she has something to offer the American public about political issues. Her name is Gorilla, and she's putting out songs FNF. It's the most debauch. I can't, I would say it almost makes Sexy Red sound like she has some talent, but I actually think she has more talent than Sexy Red, but it, it doesn't matter. Th this is where we're at, and this is how they're using rappers to dumb down and to normalize a level of idiocy, stupidity, depravity. This is, again, they're removing us from moral and religious principles. The, when when some, a woman that calls herself gorilla makes that type of music, is allowed a voice like she's a legitimate person commenting on politics and she's getting invited to the White House they're really saying, hey, your life has no meaning because a, a, a self-defined idiot is important to the American political process. Why would you take America seriously? Why would you take anything seriously if someone that calls themselves a gorilla and makes that type of music has some sort of say-so, some sort of influence over American culture? She's not alone. Again, she's just another in a long line of agents of nihilism. And so, so yesterday when I, I, I told you all about uh, the, the makings of hip hop and some of the people involved with the, the, the shareholders in hip hop, I talked to you about Harry O the guy that was doing life in prison uh, for dealing drugs. And, and he funded and started Death Row Records. And then I told you all that Donald Trump, before leaving office, gave Harry O a presidential pardon. And, and I said, not 100% sure why, but I got some theories. And like part of my theory is that American culture has been so debased and so uh, degraded, that Donald Trump pardoned Harry O because he needs Harry O, who has great influence in the hip hop industry, great influence with all these criminals that are involved in hip hop music, that perhaps Donald Trump let him out so that some of these rappers would endorse Donald Trump. And have you noticed? that now Snoop Dogg, who's friends with Harry O, Snoop Dogg, who used to work uh, for Death Row Records, Snoop Dogg, who's gang related, is now uh, comfortable saying that he supports Donald Trump. Have you not noticed that many rappers around the country are now comfortable saying they support Donald Trump? I contend some of that has to do with Harry O telling them to do that. that. This is how far we have sunk. And, 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 and th this toxin, this poison that I talked about that they released, hip hop, th this nihilism drug that they've released called hip hop, you can't contain it. It's not, as I mentioned with the, uh, the Godfather movie, it's not going to stay with the darker people. It's going to spread everywhere, and it has. I, I, I want to make one final point, because I'm going to do a deep dive. We're going to pivot and do a deep dive into Diddy. But, but you, you have, because, and I, I, I've explained to you all yesterday, Diddy's background, his father being a criminal, and drug dealer and a snitch and someone that got murdered in Central Park, unsolved murder, probably murdered by the guys he snitched on. And I said, apples don't fall far from trees. And so I, I just want you to understand this context when they impose 
this nihilistic prison culture on us and how things operate inside of a prison and how uh, all of this stuff is operating like a criminal conspiracy run by gangsters and mob members. And, and, and if, if you know anything about prison culture, and unfortunately, I know some family in prison, uh, Uncle Jimmy worked inside the Department of Corrections or the Sheriff's Office, the jail, for 15, 16, 17 years. I, I have some insight and, you know, fascinated by prison. I've read a lot of books and fascinated. But sodomy, this sexual sodomy, this sexual fluidity that's commonplace inside a prison, but sodomy is like a system of power and leverage and control inside a prison. And that's why many of these guys that participate in sodomy while in prison, they don't consider themselves gay. Because inside of a prison, sodomy is like a, a tool of control, of punking someone and, and uh, placing your dominance over that person. And then sodomy and this sexual fluidity is also a tool of leverage. It's dirt that you have over someone and you can control them. And so when you get involved in a criminal conspiracy, the main criminals, the, the, the upper level criminals, the upper level mob type figures, they just don't let you in. There's things you have to do. You're willing to kill, so you, they call in the mob movies, they call you make your bones. Have you killed someone? And there's all these little tests and all these little hoops you have to jump through. And again, we're seeing this play out in the entertainment industry because it's now fully run like a mob, like a criminal organization, fully. And it's probably always been influenced this way, but, but it's now fully run in that way. And that's why there's so much sexual deviance and perversion. That's why Cat Williams and all these other people are, are telling all about like what's going on in Hollywood and what you have to do to reach a certain level. And so some of, we have a more um, inaccurate or sanitized version of the types of things that gangsters will do to people that want to join the gang. We kind of have a, oh, they get jumped in and they get in a little fight and then they're in the gang. Or if it's the mafia, you got to kill somebody. And, and trust me, that's bad. You got to do certain things or you, you got, but, but the level of depravity and, and, and anybody that, uh, knows like Suge Knight and what was going on in out in LA and what, when he was running death row and how many former or current gang members, former criminals that were employed at death row and, and how they use sodomy and sexual exploitation and all that uh, to gain leverage over people. But I, there's a television show because it's like, I'm familiar with that, but there's a television show I think on Netflix or Amazon called Gomorrah. And it's about the Italian mafia in Italy. Not the Italian mafia here in America, the Italian mafia in Italy. And, and again, if you're a fan of The Sopranos, you'd probably like Gomorrah. It, it, it's, it's a little bit harder to follow because, you know, it, it caters to an Italian audience, and so the speech and all that, sometimes it's hard to follow, but, but <clears throat> I'm telling you I'm watching Gamara, and it's like a grittier, dirtier, nastier, less, le less alluring version of The Sopranos, and, and one of the mob bosses in a scene <laughs> I just like blew my mind, there was some young guy that was trying to get in his organization, trying to get in his organization, trying to win the boss's approval. And, and the boss kept putting him through little tests. And then just out of nowhere in a scene, the boss turns around and pisses into a coffee cup. 
and hands it to the kid and says, dr- tells him to drink it. Dude, drink it. <laughs> this is what you got to do to get in the mob? And again, there wasn't a big conversation about it. There, there wasn't like, hey, I'm going to do this. It was just like, it was so just organic and just out of nowhere. And the guy just hands him the glass of his piss and the guy just drinks it like he knew that what he's going to have to do. And, and I was like, oh, my God. That, that, to me, because, again, you're used to watching mob movies where it's like someone's got to kill somebody and that's how you get in the mob. And usually they're killing someone that deserves it. And so you, you kind of don't feel bad. Blah, but, but just to see how casual this was, that this piss in a cup, hands it to some, you know, 25-year-old guy. He drinks it down because he's trying to win the approval of the boss. That is what has been described in these lawsuits that are dogging uh, P. Diddy. A casual abuse of people. And it speaks to just how depraved and how criminal the music industry is. And, And just how nihilistic the music industry is and how all of these guys from uh, Diddy to Tupac to Biggie to all, all of these big name celeb Eminem, Dr. Dre, Cardi B, all, all 50 Cent, all of it. Just how depraved and how criminal the culture is. When you understand, because Diddy's not alone here. Everybody went to his parties. Everybody was doing things very similar. They haven't been busted yet. They haven't been sued yet. They, they, the, the, all the details haven't come out, but we've heard enough and we know enough. So no, this is a criminal organization filled with depraved people, and it's their job to be agents of nihilism. And we're falling for it. We have these people on pedestals. We idolize them. We think Tupac Shakur is a reincarnation, basically, of Jesus Christ. There are people that believe that, that like worship Tupac. He's some kind of super important figure that was so thoughtful and he was such a force for good. And he could have been president. Or he was, he was the next MLK, or he was. These are depraved, desperate agents of nihilism. They're normalizing a nihilism throughout our culture with these guys. Diddy is at the face of it. We'll get more in uh, to P. Diddy uh, when we return. Uh, You can send me some feedback, and I've been enjoying getting your feedback at fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. Make sure you're visiting fearlessarmyrollcall.com. We need you here in Nashville for Roll Call 2.0. It is going to be amazing. We're getting uh, cooperation and uh, uh, engagement and participation from a much broader spectrum of high-profile people that will come in here and give amazing speeches. You got to be here to fellowship with us. As we're going to make this the premier place for believers to come together, drink, I'm sorry, <laughs> not drink, eat, listen to music, and exchange biblical ideas about how we improve this country. And we're going to do it for believers who want to come together despite our superficial differences. We're letting too many things pull us apart, our politics, our skin color, our economic situation, whatever. We're not doing that anymore. Roll Call is bringing us all together. Go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Sign up for tickets right now. We got hotel information. We got discounts there for you. Fearlessarmyrollcall.com. I'm going to dig deeper into P. Diddy next.
Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice, no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the Most High. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possessions. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice, and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0, right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. I got my MTV out. Savage! I'm a savage! Oh! I'm a savage! Whatever I want, I'm going to get! Whatever I want, I have to get! Yes! What's next? What's next? I gotta get it. I'm not gonna stay down. I'm not gonna stay lying down. I'm not. I can't do that, man. I can't do that. What's next? Give me something else. What can't you do? I can do it. I can do anything. That is from an old documentary about P. Diddy and Bad Boy Records, Can't Stop, Won't Stop. That's from years ago, but it gives you a peek into the mindset of Sean Diddy Combs. And again, I'm a savage. I can do anything. I can get anything. I got to have everything that I want. That is Sean Diddy Combs. I want to circle back to where we left off on yesterday's show. I, I talked to you all about these lawsuits and how... Uh, there are allegations in these lawsuits, the two lawsuits, one by Cassie Ventura that was settled within 48 hours of being uh, served, and then the second one by Rodney Jones that was just filed, I believe, at the end of February that has not been settled, and it's very explosive. And some of the allegations revolve around Justin Combs, who is allegedly or believed to be P. Diddy's son. Yesterday, I talked about how people have done some uh, facial recognition comparisons between Justin Combs and a man that worked for Diddy, Anthony Wolf Jones, as a bodyguard or a security, and the similarities between Anthony Wolf Jones and Justin Combs are amazing. The Justin Combs looks a lot more like Anthony Wolf Jones, the bodyguard who was killed than he does P. Diddy. Put the facial recognition of, I think we got out of Diddy and, and 
Justin Combs. The guy looks more like the security guard, the bodyguard, who yesterday I mistakenly said uh, was killed a month. I got the years mixed up, 93, 2003. He was killed around the time, I believe Justin was 10 years old, Anthony Wolf Jones. But a lot of people think that, uh, <laughs> you know, hey, what's up here? Is this, is Justin Combs really Diddy's son? Because would you really involve your son in this level of sexual depravity? Would you really involve your son in that level of sexual depravity? Or would it be a lot easier if he wasn't really your son? Just a question we were asking. And so as we go into detail and about Diddy and these allegations and what people have said about Diddy and, and, and a lot of the gossip speculation around Diddy, it just what type of man rises to this type of power within this industry if the only way it can be explained is like this has to be a criminal organization if if someone as rotten as these allegations make diddy seem i just don't know if you can rule and rise up in any industry for 20 some odd years unless it's a criminal organization, unless it has some sort of evil, wicked plot. And so I just want to refresh your memory a little bit about the Cassie Ventura. She was the 19 year old girl. Diddy was 37 at the time. Diddy signs her to a 10 album deal. Uh, when she doesn't have the type of resume that would c command some sort of 10 album deal. And plus, it's just like a bad deal for her. She's 10 albums? What if she becomes a superstar? But regardless, she claims that, you know, when she was 21, I think on her 21st birthday, Diddy tried to rape her. She fought him off, but he later drugged her with ecstasy and other drugs and uh, raped her, beat her, sexually abused her, and then started passing her around. The, according to the allegations in her lawsuit, there were things called freak-offs, where Diddy would bring in male prostitutes, and he would sit in a corner and watch them have sex with Cassie Ventura. This lawsuit, I think Cassie's now in her 30s, but this lawsuit settled within 48 hours after filing. That's pretty unusual. I don't know how big the check he cut, but he folded quick on that allegation, and that initially made some news, and then Rodney Jones followed in behind. Rodney Jones is a producer and artist who says that Diddy groomed him into gay sex acts. That uh, Diddy, according to Rodney Jones, uh, had several people shot or was involved in shootings that a man, Fahid Muhammad, who had been Michael Jackson's security person and who I believe was on the scene the day Michael Jackson died, and he was a young person then, and that he transitions into somehow working for Diddy, and Diddy basically uses him, if you've ever seen the television show on Showtime, Ray Donovan, Ray Donovan would go around and clean up celebrity and powerful people's messes, that that was Fahid Muhammad's job. That if Diddy or anybody on his team, any of the artists on his team, had a problem with law enforcement, Fahid Muhammad would clean it up instantly. And it clean up anything, including shootings. There, there's detailed allegations in here about, like, uh, this according to Rodney Jones, what he saw, what he's a witness to, and what he can prove. He claims that Diddy drugged and raped underage girls. We played for you yesterday, uh, Rodney Jones, uh, saying that he was basically going into hiding because he fears for his life. So why would he fear for his life? Obviously, based on his allegations, he's seen Diddy do a lot of shady things. Uh, there's another 
former female artist who for years, without anybody listening to her, but for years was like, hey, Diddy's out of control. Diddy is a predator. Diddy's a, a vulture. But no one was paying attention to her. Everybody was ignoring her. Her name's Jaguar Wright. I want to play <laughs> this clip where she talks about and she only named, you can go, there's even more names of people close to Diddy who have wound up dead, uh, but she just names a few of them. Let's play the clip. Uptown Records started with five people. Andre Harrell, I'll be sure, Heavy D, and Puffy, and Kim, was the longest working employee because she was there from the very beginning. She was Andre's personal assistant. Mm. Kim is dead. Heavy D is dead. What's it? Andre Harrell is dead. The only two left are Puffy and Al, and Al almost died. Mm. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Heavy D was found dead, face down in the heart attack. Andre Harrell, heart attack. Kim died from pneumonia, but there's the first coroner's report that said that she died. It, it was ruled a homicide and they found toxins in her body to prove that she had been poisoned. You know, they, they have poisons that create heart attack and pneumonia-like symptoms. and. Then right after that, Al had a meeting and I was going to meet up with him because we were in Vegas. And then the next thing you know, you want to know what they all had in common, though? The survivors and the, and, and the late of Uptown Records, they were all writing tell-all books. Mm -hmm. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book before she died. And I'll be sure was working on the documentary of his life. And then he goes into a coma. Has Puffy ever been in a coma? Has he, has anything happened to him? <laughs> he must be the luckiest <laughs> because it seems like everybody that worked at Uptown Records from the very beginning. So go on. Just him. She's been making allegations about Puffy for years. Her allegations are resurfacing now that these lawsuits have been filed and people have been talking about Diddy and talking about his sex parties and the freak offs and all of that. And so now she's more credible. I want to play you another clip from Jaguar Wright uh, where she talks about Diddy, Andre Harrell, who she mentioned there, who's dead, uh, and, and Clive Davis. Clive Davis is another one of these shareholders that passes out shares to people like Andre Harrell and Diddy. Uh, let's play Jaguar Wright talking about Diddy, Andre, and Clive. My focus right now is Sean Combs. Okay. Tell us why. Tell us why. Because he's a sex trafficker. Okay. And he's using music and entertainment to sex traffic. Now, is this, is this just boys, girls, adults, kids? Like it I mean, from what I've heard from sources that I would consider reliable, it really doesn't matter. Wow. Um, I don't think... Sexuality is something that has anything to do with gender at this point for Sean. I, I honestly think he's just an extreme narcissist who loves power. He loves the ability to manipulate and control people. Why? Most likely because he was victimized by his mentor who loved to control people. And his mentor was? Andre Rell. Tell, tell us how he was, was mentored by Clyde Davis. Oh, oh God. It don't tell me that Andre Harrell got touched by Clive Davis, too. I'm telling you, I don't know what happened between Andre 
and, and and Clive, what I do know is that Andre got passed over. Like, wow. how do you go from being the president of Uptown and losing your entire company to your intern? Like Puff started out as an intern. Yes, he was he throwing parties with Mark Barnes in Washington, D.C. And then he became an intern at Uptown and he was very, you know, proactive. And, 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 and he, if there's one thing that Sean knows, he knows pop culture. She, she's biting her tongue a bit there and trying to speak uh, cleverly. But people have said that Andre Harrell and Diddy had some kind of sexual relationship. And, and you guys got to remember, these guys are agents of nihilism. They're pushing prison culture. And so sexual fluidity, commonplace. These guys are playing by a different set of rules. Sex is a leverage and a tool of power and control and mental dominance to them. See, nihilism, the removal of, the rejection of moral and religious principles. And so these guys are playing by a completely different set of rules. Life has no meaning beyond money and power and whatever they can get right now. They're predators. And so the Clive Davis, he's an out of the closet uh, bisexual or homosexual person. And he has talked about his relationship with Puffy. Uh, let's play, let's hear from Clive Davis. Puffy loved music. We had a very open, honest relationship with each other. And his vision and our strength and ability and being able to fulfill someone else's vision was working like a charm. So that to some extent, in looking back, I write in my book, I could be Mr. Magoo. I didn't, you know, I never had a bodyguard. Maybe I was in the midst. And of course, I read. It's not that I was not aware. I'm a hands-on guy. But... I was always treated by the hip hop community with enormous respect, whether it's respect for all of the music and artists I've been involved with. So I didn't take, perhaps a little stupidly, serious that there could be some personal insecurity here. You open up a very important dialogue, I think, in, in music with you coming out and talking about your sexuality openly. And Frank Ocean also is another artist who opened up this year about his sexuality. Do you think that there's other hip hop and R&B artists that are closeted and would it affect their careers and their marketing and album sales if they were to come out? I discuss bisexuality because it's so misunderstood and just said, for me, later in life, I could be attracted to a woman. I could be attracted to a man. Each story is different. I'm very gratified in the case of Frank Ocean that the hip hop community has embraced him. And maybe we're reaching that time where people can judge everyone without reference to their sexual preference or identity. So you've heard me on this show for three years. So talk about the Alphabet Mafia. And, you know, mostly I was connected to the BLM, the LGBTQ, you know, all these lettered organizations that uh, are in control. And, and, and the music industry and, and the prison industrial company, this is the head of, this is ground zero, this is Mecca for the Alphabet Mafia. And, and so, and they run like the mafia. And this is a sex cult where, where everybody uses people's sexual perversions to control each other. And it's like you have to jump into that sex pool in order to be trusted. And so, just like how in the Italian mafia, you basically got to kill someone to be in good and to be trusted in the entertainment alphabet mafia. You have to be sexually fluid in order to be let fully in. Oh, you can be a soldier, 
and work from the outside. But if you want to be a made man, you have to be no holes barred. And, and that's what we're looking at, this nihilism and this entire way, the way the thing is working like a criminal organization, like it's working just how things work in prison. They're spreading a prison mentality and a prison culture all over the globe. And all the influencers that they, again, that you think have FU money, they've been given the money so that someone can F them. F me money is what they have. I, 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 I can only take credit for piggybacking what Cat Williams put on the table. And, and again, a lot of our conversations since that Cat Williams Club Shay Shay, it opened the door for, for me to have a conversation and explain things to you that would have sounded crazy until Cat Williams opened that door and now we can have the discussion and, and we can have the full discussion about like what's going on in American culture. How did we get here? How did the transgender movement, how did uh, appointing transgender, transvestites, people with serious mental illnesses, how did we get here to where installing them, placing them in high power positions? How, how, they've changed the culture. The, the social media apps have helped them, particularly Twitter under Jack Dorsey. But, but the music industry has been leading the charge in normalizing prison culture. Cat Williams called uh, uh, Diddy out on the Shay Shay interview. Let's play the clips. All of these uh, big deviants is all catching hell in 2024. It's up for all of them. It don't matter if you Diddy or whoever you is. T.G. Jakes, any of them. The, every, all lies will be exposed. That's all. And, and, and anyone who takes that the wrong way know why they take it the wrong way. The truth is the light. Now, I've had to turn down $50 million four times. Four times just to protect my integrity and that virgin hole I was telling you about. <laughs> right. Because uh, P. Diddy be wanting the body. And you got to tell him no. Oh, you got you. to tell him no. I, I did. I did. Oh, See, I got the receipts for everything I'm telling you. That's why I can yeah, say them yeah, so freely. I don't want to look at nothing I don't want to have. Because I, I know how blessed I am. If I look at it, I got it. <laughs> That's how Diddy be feeling. Now, come on, man. Come on. Cat referenced T.D. Jakes in, in his interview uh, with Shay Shay. And, and, and this is why you have to be suspicious. Because we're going to play these a little bit out of order. We're going to play Gene Deal next talking about T.D. Jakes. Uh, but, but this influence of the entertainment industry and turning people out and normalizing things, it, it touches a guy like T.D. Jakes who's always been the celebrity, the go-to celebrity pa pastor for black celebrities and athletes. T.D. Jakes, based off of everything we've heard about his involvement with Diddy and going to these Diddy parties, T.D. Jakes has been turned out by this industry. He's been caught up in it. This prison culture, this nihilism, this pursuit of material things by any means necessary. This is affecting our entire culture. And I'm entire. I'm not talking about black culture. I'm talking about American culture. It's a poison and a toxin that is spreading. You're wondering why your kids have so many sexual identity issues? What's, what's the music they've been listening to? And I'm not talking about when they're 12 and 13 years old. What music were you playing when they were in the womb? If scientists will tell you that reading to your child while in the womb will increase their IQ and they can learn while in the womb, you think this perverted satanic music that you're listening to 
has no influence on your child? You think that when they're three and four and five years old, they don't know these rap lyrics? And, and when the way the, the, the culture has been manipulated, they've made every kid think, every kid, that the black gangster rapper is the coolest thing on the planet and he sets the agenda for what's cool and what you should wear and what you should think? You think Snoop smoking all that weed and being celebrated and in every commercial on the planet, you think that hasn't influenced your child and your community? Everybody think, oh, smoking weed is no big deal and it has no real impact and it's better than drinking and oh, you need to get over it. This is all a byproduct. You know what they do <laughs> in prison to pass the time to do those years? They get high every single day. The, the guards smuggle it in and sell it to them. Their friends smuggle it in them and they sell it to other inmates. But prisons are some of the highest places on earth. That's how everybody's making money. And, and that's why the promotion of getting high is like it's the greatest thing. And that's what we've we've sat and watched Snoop Dogg be high every day for 30 straight years. And we just laugh it off. And Snoop's just one of the guys and bring him home to Martha Stewart. Bring him home to your father. Bring him home to your mother. It's crazy. They've perverted the entire culture. They got T.D. Jakes. Let's play Gene Deal. Uh, is a former bodyguard that worked a lot of uh, P. Diddy's parties. Let's play the clip. Man, what I think about it is this, you know, when I grew up in the church, the sinners was not supposed to have the same atmosphere with the saints. You had to be able to se separate the two. So I'm looking at him as a saint going to a party that ain't nothing but sin, drinking, maybe fornication, man on man, woman on woman, he on she. But maybe he'd have to lay some hands on somebody. Maybe he'd have to save some souls. I know he got a contract with Revolt, so I'm just like, it, it, it's just real strange that he would be found at any kind of Diddy party or any kind of uh, place with Diddy unless it's in a business atmosphere. So now what he's doing is he's making, he, he, he man, he making the Christians look real bad right about now. And you've been to these parties, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was there when he was doing the white parties in the Hamptons and the old nine yards. So I know what goes on at the parties. If you know, they probably got a little bit more freakier, you know, as time went on, you know, because they got to the point where is that they didn't even care. It used to be secretly, you know, where people used to go to, you know, separate rooms and different rooms and they wasn't doing that out in the public, you know. So, But now they don't care. Men kissing men and all this other stuff. That's just crazy. They certainly don't care. You think Birdman cares? Every time he puts his lips on Lil Wayne? You, you, you think Birdman cares? Th this is their job to normalize prison values, to normalize nihilism. They got T.D. Jakes caught up. Doesn't really surprise me. And, and just for, for those of you that have been so immersed in this prison mentality and you don't even know it. You don't even know why you're so uh, ruled by your racial idolatry. Because I've watched this change in real time when, when we did used to somewhat and, and lean into judging people by shared values and principles and whether you could trust them, a shared faith, good person, blah, blah, blah. But, but here we have moved in the last 10 years, everything is a racial decision. 
oh, they're white, therefore they're wrong. I'm black, therefore I'm right. He's black, therefore he's wrong. I'm white, therefore I'm right. We've moved into that. Because that's the way people think in prison. That's a prison mentality. But just so those of you that think that way, just uh, take the, T.D. Jakes is no different than the Carl Lentz from Hillsong Church. If you remember him, he fell. He's trying to run around with the celebrities, the athletes, and trying to be the minister to the celebrity. And he's dressing all hip and cool. He's trying to fit in with the world. No different than T.D. Jakes. And remember they found out Carl Lentz that, you know, banging his nanny, destroyed his marriage, banging everybody that he could. So for those of you that, you know, are heavy into that prison racial idolatry mentality, right, Carl Lentz, no different than T.D. Jakes. A lot of these ministers caught up in all of this stuff. What, what, Y'all have listened to me talk about Mike Todd and how much I used to like Mike Todd. This dude's trying to dress like rappers virtually every Sunday, everywhere he goes. He wants to be hip. He wants to fit in with the world. He, he, the, the, the rap world sets the agenda for him in terms of style, in terms of conversation, in terms of how he conveys his message, who he's reaching out to. He's no different than Ice-T who said, I'm rapping for the penitentiary. I'm telling the guys in the penitentiary what they want to hear. Mike Todd is telling the guys in the hip hop world what they want to hear. And look, I dress just like you. And, and I, I put on thousand dollar tennis shoes and $2,000 jeans, and I'm a radical materialist just like you. No, I've ignored the, the thing in the Bible that says, you know, it's, it'll be easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man. Mike Todd wants to try that. He wants to be that rich man. He's going to be the camel that makes it through the needle. And he wants everybody to know it. I want to play you a couple of more. Not, not that... We need uh, any more proof of what Diddy <laughs> had going on, but I just want to, there was an actor named Spanky Hayes that used to go to Diddy parties, and uh, he's on record about what he personally witnessed at Diddy parties. So we're going to play the, uh, the, the clip Puffy had a party everywhere and he, he saw gay sex. Let's, let's play that one first. Puffy had a party everywhere. Every major, if it was a Soul Train event, Puffy got a party there. If it's a Vibe Award, Puffy got a party there. So Puffy had the parties, bro. He had the dopest party. If you didn't go to a Puffy party, you weren't there. You can't really talk about right. being there if you wasn't at Puffy's party. Now, did I see things? Yes. I've seen a lot of things. Um, I remember walking in a room trying to find a bathroom, and I can't say no names, and that's not like me because I love saying names. But uh, this is kind of a touchy subject, so I won't say the name. Uh, they were doing some pretty wild things. And I remember they had a fake hairline, and the hairline was sweated. And that's what I remember more than anything is the hairline being sweated. Like, what the f are they doing? So I immediately shut the door, went back out and tried to party. I couldn't get that off my head because I just seen some right then. And then I was like, I mean, I'm ready to go. And this was two men to be be particular two men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was it was one girl there, but she was her eyes were this big. So that means she wasn't participating. Correct. So she was looking at some sh she wasn't sure if she should be seen. So <clears throat> what the guy's talking about is this woman's bugged out probably because she's on drugs. And she is seeing something that's probably shocking. But, but, but what I'm telling you about this nihilism that, that they have made us all dive headfirst into, 
And look, drugs have been around forever in the 60s and people use drugs, but, but now it's been so normalized that people look at you like you're crazy if you don't do drugs. And, and people like me look back at them like, no, nah, it's crazy to do drugs because you will do things on drugs that you normally wouldn't do. And drugs are a tool to bring your inhibitions down. And so they call it bringing your inhibitions down, but it's basically drugs are an excuse to throw your morals out the window. And so in hip hop, in this prison culture environment where everybody <laughs> loves to get high, and you go to a party, you get high, they get a little coke in you, they get some ecstasy in you, they put some alcohol in you, and the next thing you know, you're getting rear-ended. You've had a traffic accident and you've been completely rear-ended. And, and, and that once you've been rear-ended once, it's like you can't take it back. It's like me and a bag of Doritos. Once I have one Dorito, the bag is done. I just want to have one Dorito. <laughs> That's all. Who stops after one Dorito? And, and so you've been rear-ended. And you'll be rear-ended again because you've already done it. It's, I'll give you another fat person analogy. It's like fat people that are watching this or people that are trying to lose weight, you can relate to what I'm about to tell you. You wake up every day. I'm going to be perfect today. I'm going to work out. I'm going to do this. Blah, blah. And, and you make a mistake. And, and this is what I, the mistake I used to make. I'd get up with the best intentions, and then I'd get in my car, and I'd be driving, and I'd see that McDonald's, and I would pull in, and I'd get me two sausage and egg McMuffins. And I'd eat those sausage and egg McMuffins. I'd say, all right, I'm done. Oh, that's great. And then it would become around lunchtime. I said, well, <laughs> I've already eaten the sausage and egg McMuffin. It's already a bad day. Let me throw this double filet of fish and large fry, or let me throw some Hattie B's chicken on top of this. It's already been a bad day. I'll do it again tomorrow. And then you get to dinner and you do the exact same thing. It's already a bad day, so who cares? That's how they get you. Give you some drugs. Put, put, something, put an attractive woman in front of you who's probably paired up with some dude, and you're on the drugs, there's a hot woman there, she's bisexual, and the next thing you know, you're drunk high, and she's whispering in your ear, she's doing this and that, and someone's rear-ending you, or someone has reached over and touched your private part whose hands are as big as your hands. And because you're high, you don't notice how rough those hands are. And then the next thing you know, well, I've already done it. Well, <laughs> or, and again, in prison, what the, and I've never been to prison, I'm just telling you what I've heard and what I, <laughs> what I'm not, is these dudes, they just close their eyes and whoever's sucking on their thing, they pretend it's a woman. Once you do it once, you'll do it again. That's how they get you. And that's how they got T.D. Jakes, and that's how they're getting all of you, with drugs and to move. The drugs are to remove your morals, not your inhibitions. Your inhibitions are really your morals talking to you, saying, I'm not about this life. But they, and now, they've just convinced us that anybody that's not sexually fluid, they're some sort of homophobe, or they're some sort of uptight person, and they're not cool. I'm gonna play this last clip as a part of this segment because it was really the most profound clip I think I heard in all of the research we've done looking into Diddy and, and trying to put this story and narrative together. Spanky Hayes, I thought, <clears throat> said the best thing I, I, I heard in all of this. He broke down what's going on? And I was like, oh man, I'd like to meet this dude someday. Uh, play this final Spanky Hayes clip. If you, if you are not controlling your soul, I don't think, I think someone has a more control on you. 
and they guide you to these things and they you know they make it so like well you're doing good now but if you come to this party i'm pretty sure you'll get that three picture deal uh if you yeah. go in that room back there i'm pretty sure you'll have what you would you you'll leave here happy so it's like it's just like things that if you don't have a soul basically they don't have souls and they're give, they're doing anything to be a star they're being anything to be the person that they dreamed about doing and they will do anything at that point god is not involved so i think once you take god out of it out of your life ain't no telling mm-hmm. what you're gonna end up doing I'm going to tell you why. See, that it connects everything. What did we say the definition of nihilism is? The rejection of any religious and or moral principles in the belief that life has no meaning. So what Spanky's saying is, and what nihilism is saying, let's remove God, and now you'll do anything. And I got a hats off this man. That, that he knows that and he's sharing that. And that's why when you look at American society and, and its collapse and its decay and its fall into depravity, we've removed God. He's now optional. We've got to have separation of church and state. And, and, and oh, Christian nationalists, they're bad. And Christianity, oh, that's the white racist man's religion. You don't need God. That's an idiot talking. But who does not realize he's been moved to that position through the music and the culture that we have adopted and have mainstreamed over the last 40 years. That is the job of hip hop. And, and do these guys want to make money? The, the people at the top, the vanguards, the black rocks? Yes. But more important than any of that, by a mile, is turning our culture nihilistic so that we will surrender to Marxism and communism so that we will surrender our freedoms. You understand, prison culture is antithetical to freedom, particularly American freedom that was defined in our founding documents as rights and freedoms coming from God, not government. That's why they want to remove God. Once they remove God, they can then say, we got to rewrite this Constitution. That's the agenda. It's a slow process. It's a process that most people don't recognize as it's happening. We've all been focused in on some racial angle or some financial angle, and we can't see the elites have a much more wicked plan, a much a a much more clever plan. They've tricked us into fighting. Those of us that know that there's a God and that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, they've tricked us into fighting over, well, you're black and I'm white. Oh, you're a conservative, I'm a liberal. You're a Republican, I'm a Democrat. You're rich, I'm poor. They've tricked us into fighting over all of this inconsequential stuff as they've moved God out of the equation, made us more robotic, less in love with freedom, easier to control, this whole dumbing down. They put a woman like Gorilla on CNN talking about the presidency and they invite her to the White House because they want us dumb. They want you dumb. Do you know how much easier we are to control when we're dumb? when we don't even understand the benefits of our founding principles, when they've convinced us, yeah, them slave owning races, they wrote a constitution that uh, is totally racist and biased and you can't 
survive, you can't make progress with that Constitution and that Declaration of Independence. Only a dummy would believe that. But they've dumbed us down to such a level. They've instilled us with so many prison values that all they have to say is, that's racist. And we'll throw all logic and reason out the window. And we'll shut up and we'll surrender and we'll give up freedoms and we won't value freedom and we'll start, well, I'll be just as happy if, you know, the government tells me what to eat, when to eat. If I own, if I don't own anything, I'll be happy. The government, we'll hand it all over to the government. And, and, and I don't blame many of you. If, if I didn't, uh, Believe in God. If I thought I had to do it alone with just me. Yeah, I'd want to turn it over to somebody else, too. But because I've partnered with God, with Jesus Christ. No, it's like, no, I, I got this. Just government, get out of my way. Me and Jesus are going to handle this. And, and many of you that are brilliant, smarter than me uh, and came into this understanding before me are like, no, man, I got I got Jesus, I got my wife, and I got my kids. I got this, I'm good. I'm gonna have enough kids, I'm gonna have my own little army, and me and my wife and my kids and their kids, we got this. Government, get out of the way. Don't try to take any of these rights that God gave me. But those of you that think you're just out here on your own, yeah, I don't blame you. You're partnering up with the government. You don't have the confidence to take care of yourself. You don't think you can compete. And so, yeah, I'll throw away my freedom and just wait on a PPP loan or a government check, welfare. I, I, I'll let uh, public education educate my kids. I'll set them in front of a video game, get, hand them a cell phone, and I'll go sit in my bedroom and get high or go to some nightclub and party with my girlfriends, and be, as what's her, Gorilla says, I'm free. That, that, that's the kind of idiots. That's what this culture has been turned into. I'm going to, because I'm being really hard on hip hop, but we've been heading this direction for a long time, before hip hop. I'm going to bring the Beatles <laughs> and Tupac Shakur into this conversation. That's how we're going to wrap up and conclude Diddy and the shocking truth about hip hop. We're gonna talk about the Beatles and Tupac Shakur next. Back to beef as I walk you through uh, my top 50 media beefs of all time. Yeah, I'm an equal opportunity beefer. It's like, Randy, are you asleep at the wheel? Big lips are in style. I'd love to squash this beef. I mean, I was not real happy at all. I, I, I was less than thrilled. I was displeased. And now we have beef. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I want to begin this portion of the conversation uh, talking about the Beatles. And, and I, I want to talk about the Beatles because I don't want anybody to think that this negative, nihilistic deal in the music industry started with hip-hop. It's most pronounced, and it's a clear... Uh, leading tool right now in the nihilistic part, but, but the music industry has been demonic and criminal long before hip hop. I, I just wanna make that clear, I wanna be fair. And so I wanna show you all an album cover from 1968. Uh, I think it was the Beatles' ninth studio album. 
uh, Yesterday and Today is the name of the album. And so that's the Beatles, the world's favorite rock group, rock band, whatever, uh, on the cover of their Yesterday and Today album. And they have severed baby heads and body parts laying all around them. This caused quite a stir in 1968, and it was called the Butcher Cover. The Beatles defended it, I think, saying that, uh, you know, the record labels were butchering our albums, and that's why we did it. It was a lark, or it was pushback on that. But many people said then and say now that the Beatles were influenced heavily by Satanist Aleister Crowley. And I don't know if there could be a more demonic album cover than that. That looks like aborted babies. That the slaughter of children on the cover of an album. And so whatever point they were trying to make, why not put slaughtered cows around them? If you've been butchered, why does it have to be babies? And, and so there are many people, you go, a lot of people, like I like Led Zeppelin move, music. There's a lot of people that say Led Zeppelin's music has some demonic energy behind it and some negative messaging that, that, that music does. And then let, let, let's take the Beatles out of it. But, but that is our theme uh, for yesterday and today, and so we put some of the hip hop people on a billboard that mimics and mocks uh, that Beatles cover. And I think that's Birdman and uh, Liar Cohen and with the slot, uh, Suge Knight, slaughtered heads of, 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 Snoop and some other people, but it, we're, we're mocking that. But I don't, I don't, it's not just this nihilism has been around yesterday and today. That's the point. That's why we're using the Beatles cover, and that's what made me think about it. But, but I want to broaden it out even to Quincy Jones, one of the greatest names in the music business history. Did, did Quincy Jones not? write in a Playboy article five, 10 years ago about sleeping with Richard Pryor and sleeping with other uh, male artists? Did Quincy Jones not come out of the closet and say that you know he was sodomizing uh, people that wanted to move up in the entertainment industry? Did, I'm correct in that. And so, this is one of the most historical figures in music who's been around since the 1960s. The Beatles, obviously, popular in the 50s and 60s. This whole little sexual depravity and sexual fluidity deal has been a part of the music industry yesterday and today. The music industry is a cesspool, and it has been doing a slow march towards nihilism. It sped up with rap because, because they found like, oh, we got a genre of music that relies on young people from broken family situations, that relies on a more vulnerable working class, a more vulnerable talent class. That's why when we started this yesterday, I brought Diddy's father into this to give you a, a sense of like, Diddy comes from a tough background where he might have been sexually exploited as a child and certainly as a young adult to move up in the music industry. Andre Harrell, Clive Davis may have taken advantage of him. How did this happen? He's vulnerable, no father in the home, his father's been murdered. And so there is this demographic in America, my demographic, the black demographic. Kids, 75% of them raised up in single parent homes. 
They're more vulnerable. Rap music has leaned into them. And so now you have desperate, poor, undiscipled young men and women who are being had money waved in front of them and a chance to be rich and the cool kids and to take care of their family. And all they have to do is cuss and say the N word and preach prison values uh, in their music. And, and the people they partnered with, the other shareholders, have told them, we got this. We're going to spin this in the, in the media like you guys are activists and revolutionaries. What did Jerry Heller, what, the clip I played yesterday, oh my God, he said this. And beat me out when I say it, but I'm just trying to keep it real. He said, with the hard R, niggers with attitude. Yeah, that's what MLK and Bobby Kennedy would be doing if they were alive today. He said that. And so, and they spun that. All the things that have been written about hip hop and the way it's been celebrated and glorified and we're making movies about NWA and calling these guys heroes, they spread a poison. This would be the same. I'm gonna give you a real world, real time example. If, if 20 years from now, they're making movies about Dr. Fauci and calling him a hero and celebrating him as a hero who, you know, he's the real star of COVID. That's what this is the equivalent of. NWA sold poison. That music, including F the Police, but let's say you exclude F the Police. Go listen to their albums. They put out two. There's nothing positive. It's all negative, promoting violence, promoting drug use, promoting disrespect for women, promoting uh, violent behavior towards black men. It, it, it's amazing and, and that, that they could put out that type of music and have the media write about it that totally contradicts the message of the music. But that's how much power the puppet masters have. That's how, the, how much the media is in on celebrating and promoting nihilism. This is how much the left is in on that. And, and look, some people, some people on the right are into it as well. Yeah, it's just business, it's capitalism. It, no, it's obscenity that is ruining the lives of children and destroying our culture and making it more and more unsafe in all kinds of ways and it's infringing on our freedom. It is connected, as I keep arguing, to why we don't value freedom anymore and why people are like, hey, free speech, I, I kind of care less, people need to be censored, blah, blah. Because they don't really have freedom and they have no freedom in prison. And so they just don't, they learn to not value it. They learn to live without it. And they want you to learn to live without it. And they've been spreading false narratives and, and using plants like Diddy forever. And again, it was a much more subtle sell in the 60s and 70s because the public wasn't ready for it and, and you know, the, the, the culture wasn't ready for it. But now with this hip hop thing and this whole heat shield that they have, the reason why they've used rap and black people is because they have this shield of if you criticize it, you're racist. If you criticize anything that these rappers say, no matter how despicable, if Dej Loaf wants to say, I hate N-words, I'm a Nazi. Man, that's one of the greatest songs ever, and she's great, and how dare you say anything about it. You're an Uncle Tom and a coon, or you're a sellout. That's what makes hip-hop such a perfect tool to spread nihilism. Because they, they got the whole thing on lock in terms of, if you criticize it, we'll get people in the media to call you racist or a sellout. And 
we have such control over the media, we can manufacture because a lot of hip hop, it's not about, oh, does they have a great voice and can they sing? Uh, you know, because it's any, any style of voice works in hip hop. As we see now with all these female rappers and, you know, and male rappers, they, they all got different kinds of voice. There, there is no really talent to the voice. There are guys that rap and tell better stories, but, but, but a lot of hip hop is built off of uh, authenticity or pretend authenticity or a character. It's like the WWE or the, w, you know, the World Wrestling, or is it WWF, World Wrestling Federation? It's a script. It, it, it's, you can build fake narratives around people and that will help sell the music. Oh my God, 50 Cent, he got shot nine times. He's a real gangster. He's talking about the streets in a real, real way. He's the truth. And they can get their magazine writers, their newspaper writers, their television interviewers to all sell. He's an authentic criminal. And it's, it's no, if you went to go see that movie I recommended to you guys, American Fiction, it, it's, it's kind of like that. Weez grooves up in the ghetto. You know, the, the, if the, the more stereotypical you are, the dumber, the more of a minstrel show you're willing to put on, the more criminal you're willing to portray yourself, the more they'll get the media to sell it and the more albums you will sell. And so this is where, <laughs> sit back, uh, you Tupac groupies, get prepared, hop in the comments, uh, tell everybody I'm the uh, worst person in the world. But, but I wanna explain to you like what the puppet masters and what the people running the music industry, just how clever they are. And, and I'm not gonna claim this is something I've thought for a long time, but just doing a deep dive and, and researching this whole uh, industry and story and trying to put this story together. I, I, guy that helps me research this, was like, hey man, you need to take a look at Tupac Shakur. And, and Jason, you need to think about uh, the story they sold us about Tupac Shakur and how they made him the face of rap music. And so Tupac was uh, with Digital Underground. And what was the song? I Get Around. He, you know, he was one, he dancer with Digital Underground, did a little rapping with Digital Underground. But, but he wasn't the face of hip hop in the early 1990s. But then in 1994, Tupac's at a studio in New York and he gets shot. He gets shot five times. He gets shot in the groin. He gets shot uh, in the hand. I think he gets shot in the back and he got shot twice in the head. It's an amazing story, but, but, but before I get to the shot deal, I want to walk you back to who Tupac was with Digital Underground and before. But I want to walk you back to high school, and, and I want to play you a clip of Tupac, I believe, at 18 years old, interview he's doing. I, I'm, I'm a, when you watch this clip, I'm not really going to call him Tupac. I, I, this is Zesty Shakur. That, that's probably the name he was using at that time is Zesty. Let's play Zesty Secu Shakur. But it's harder to see the bad things and everybody wants to shield the bad things and that's where it gets complicated and it gets real frightened. That's when everybody gets surprised and oh my God, I'm committing suicide. That's too much overwhelming. If, it doesn't, if you know about it, it won't be so overwhelming. No, so that's what I think about that. Well, how, do you, how do you keep so positive? You say that you had a you had a problem childhood, but yet you, you seem like you've gotten above that. Oh, is is that you know, like if you're lost, 
if you are lost in the wilderness and you have a guide, then it's not like being lost. It's like learning new things as you go through. So when you finally get through, you forgot where you were going to. You just want to talk about the path that you just went. And that's how I feel. Like like life, my child, I was just totally lost at first because, okay, I got to go to the beginning. My mother was a Black Panther and she was really involved in the movement, you know, just black people bettering themselves and things like that. My father was a hustler, a street hustler, you know. I think he, you know, sold drugs and everything. And how did they get together is beyond me, but he just saw her as a woman doing something and like, you know. But, so my mother and father both had bad childhoods. And I never knew who my father was. I met him, but he died and that was horrible, but got over that. Does, does Zesty Secure fit the profile of what I've been talking about the past two days? That's him at some private performing arts school, I, I believe, in, in 1988. That's Zesty Shakur. Only Bruce Jenner can judge me. That, that's who that was. How did they turn Zesty Shakur into thug life tatted across his stomach and to the ultimate gangster. Again, he's at a performing arts school learning how to act. He's headed towards the entertainment industry. And, and so how do you transition that guy to that guy? How, how, how do you do that? And one of the ways you do it in rap, man, if he gets shot, if he survives getting shot, now we got a real G on our hands. Now we got somebody we can sell. Now we got a thug. And so I want you to think about, I want to play this clip of a news report about Tupac Shakur. He's now transformed from Zesty to Tupac Shakur and him getting shot in New York. This is not him getting shot in Vegas and killed. This is him getting shot, I believe, in 1994. I believe it's November 30th, 1994. The same time he's on trial for sodomy of some woman. But let's play the news clip that kind of summarizes uh, Tupac Shakur getting shot and the whole nine. It's December 1st, 1994. Please, 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 please. The rare, raw footage of Tupac Shakur in a wheelchair the morning after he was shot in Manhattan. Despite five bullet wounds, the iconic rapper is on his way to court to hear the verdict in his sexual assault case. A series of events that would change his life and, in turn, rap history forever. I wanted to know more, so I searched deep into the Fox 5 archives from our reporting at the time. Tell have no fury like a woman sports. We found this impromptu press conference. Why am I the only one in court right now? Why is the cameras all on me? Not long after his arrest on the charges. I guess I am going to say that I'm a thug. That's because I came from the gutter and I'm still here. I'm not saying I'm a thug because I want to rob you and rape people and things. I'm a businessman. And outside the court as the trial was under way. I want straight up not guilty. And finally, the night he was shot in the lobby of Quad Studios on November 30th, 1994, a hot spot for rap artists at the time. That's Sean Diddy Combs outside as police arrived on scene. He was shot numerous times, at least twice in the head. Shot numerous times, at least twice in the head. And Sean Diddy was on the scene of that, which infuriated uh, Tupac and made him think that Diddy was involved in the shooting, and that's what set off the feud. But, but I, I want you to think this through. A man gets shot twice in the head, once in the groin, once in the back, and once in the hand on November 30th. And on December 1st, just a few hours after they complete surgery, he's, he's checked himself out of the hospital. 
Does, that doesn't raise any eyebrows to you. That, that doesn't, to me, it sounds like Building 7 falling. And, and I, I wish I had thought it in 94, but I was a kid and I was busy. Uh, and, you know, at that time you believed everything you were told. And, it's, and look, the media is just reporting what they're being told. But does that make any sense? You got shot twice in the head, once in the groin, in the hand and in the back or abdomen area, I can't remember, but, and you're rolling out of the hospital shortly thereafter? You're, you're that type of a G? Zesty secure in six years? Went from zesty to, yeah, I took these five bullets, two in the head, and I'm out of the hospital 24 hours after I got shot. You got to make that make sense to me. I, I don't buy it. I, I, I don't buy It's my belief. I don't buy it. Tupac is a psyop. He was installed. They took a zesty actor and said, we're going to make you play the role of the ultimate thug. Because we got this prison culture we need to sell. And you're desperate. You didn't know your father. Your mother was in the Black Panthers and she was strung out on drugs. You're desperate, zesty, you're sexually fluid. And in order to get you this money and this fame that you want, we're, we're gonna, you're gonna have to go through this sigh up of pretending to be shot in the head and all this other stuff. And uh, you're gonna have to do this time at Clinton Correctional Facility. Uh, for, you know, getting convicted of these charges. But when you come out on the other side of that, whoo, Suge Knight's going to come pick you up and we're going to drop bags of cash on you and you're going to be the face of gangster rap. You, look, I know people's voices change. But you can't go from all these zesty mannerisms. I didn't really know my dad. That was tough. To the ultimate thug. With, with, with a much deeper voice. It, it, just, it just doesn't happen. That's a role you're playing. And, and all of what I'm talking about connects to, listen to everything I've been saying over the past three, four months, and really over the entire time, but the last three or four months about Stephen A. Smith and that book he wrote, and these lies he's getting away with telling, all of these people, it's a script, it's a narrative, it's a role they're being asked to play, to sell something. They don't give you F you money. They give you F me money to promote nihilism because they don't know what to do with all of these people that are being displaced by technology and all of these people that they think are overpopulating their planet. They want to get rid of you. They want you to go away quietly and take whatever little freedom they're willing to offer you without complaint. Go sit down and shut up until you die and we want you to adopt a sexual lifestyle that prevents you from reproducing because we want less people. Life has no meaning. Life is really for us handful of elites that have all kinds of money and we're the special people, we're the chosen. The rest of you need to go away quietly and quit coming to us complaining about how much money we make and what all we're doing. We have rules for you. We have freedom for us. Now, go call each other the N-word and shoot and kill each other, and we're done with you. And th that, that exact same plan, I know you racial idolaters think it's just directed at, at people with dark skin. It's directed at all of us. All of us, regardless of color. You're not one of the elites. You don't have a bunker. Finally, <clears throat> and again, 
I want y'all to marinate on that. Uh, get in the hop in the comments, and I know you Tupac groupies that think Tupac is the greatest thing since sliced bread. How dare Whitlock question Tupac Shakur? What a sellout. What a Uncle Tom. Tupac survived them shots. Ain't no way they think that. Ain't no way. He's, Tupac's a, li a legend. He's everything. He's retarded nihilist that sold you poison, that helped destroy your community, helped destroy your worldview, helped walk you away from God. That's who Tupac is. An actor playing a role. Did they kill him? Probably. I mean, he's dead. I don't think he, I don't think the thing out in Vegas, I think they were done with him. He had served his purpose. There's more value in him as a martyr and a symbol and dead. It's just like a great painting. When the painter dies, the value goes up. He's done with Tupac. Plus, he was a tiny bit uncontrollable. Probably didn't, that role was probably eating him up because it ain't really him. I want to play one final thing that I feel ties all of this together. And, and, and it's a point I've made, but I just, I just wanted to hammer it, repeat it, and uh, so that maybe this time when you hear it, you'll hear it in context. Uh, but Kanye West, when he was going through his controversies a couple of years ago, uh, he did an interview in a parking lot or on the street, in a car, in an SUV, paparazzi's asking him questions. And I thought he said one of the truest things about hip hop and the industry and being a public figure and being a uh, pop culture celebrity and influencer and what the price of that was and how they control you. And he talked about how, unlike a lot of these other people, I can't be controlled. And then at the end of it, he kind of, he listed the reason why he can't be controlled. And it, to me, it speaks to this entire prison culture that I keep talking about. And how Hollywood, the music industry, and how it's actually run, and how they leverage you like you're a prison inmate or like you're in the mafia. Let's play the clip. They can't control me, you get what I'm saying? They can control Shaq, they can control Charles Barkley, they can control LeBron James, they can control Jay-Z and Beyonce. But not you, man. But they can't control me. It's you see, you. it ain't no name I won't name. Exactly. It's up. Not you. You know what I'm saying? And just for Minister Farrakhan, I love you, but the way you read that, I took that as a slight. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't take no disrespect from nobody, so let's get on the phone and let's talk that out. I don't care who you are. I ain't taking no slice from nobody, right? I ain't taking no slice from nobody. It's God. That's the only person that I serve. My mama ain't here. My mama was sacrificed. Me too. You understand? Yeah, you appreciate Michael you. Jordan, what about him? His daddy, right? Bill Cosby, his son, right? Dr. Dre, his son. You're out in Hollywood, a lot of people come up missing. Feels like it might be a lot of that in order to control, traumatize. They want to monetize and traumatize. And God loved me. You understand? They, they yes. hit me. Gap, Adidas, all that away. Still, Forbes, who hate me, right, had to write net worth 400 million. Jesus is king. God loved me. That's more important than thinking in life. That's the thing. You know what I'm saying? It's, and this truth is going to be heard. I can't send none of y'all meat mills, y'all puppies, y'all little boozy, none of these names. None of these people that have to listen to y'all because they're dealing with, they have legal. I never killed nobody, right? That never killed nobody, right? But that means I can say whatever I want and not go to jail. And even if they did figure out a way, I'm still not backing down from what I said. So when he starts out talking about Shaq and Charles Barkley and LeBron uh, and how they can control them, 
he's not talking about the murder part. He's, he's talking about they got enough dirt on those guys uh, or those guys have participated in enough of the sexual hijinks and depravity out in Hollywood or wherever that ah, they feel comfortable. Ah, we, we, we put them on Epstein's Island. We put them in a compromising position and we got them. But as it relates to this rap thing, it's like they intentionally go after criminals and install them in positions of power because they know that any time they want to put Birdman down, they got the dirt, they got the goods on him. And, and Kanye, that's what Kanye's basically saying. is like a lot of these dudes, Meek Mill and whatever, they was about that street life and they killed someone and the puppet masters know it. And could at any time, we can end your career. Well, you got enough rapes on you and enough women that we can bring out of the closet on you that we can control you. And Kanye's saying, they don't have that kind of dirt on me. He, he lives pretty transparently. Uh, and this isn't some great defense of Kanye because, you know, Kanye can't shake off his spiritual demons. And, and sometimes he makes sense, but a lot of times, you know, them demons got control of him and he's a slave to his sex organ. But he spoke some real truth there and provided you a look, a real look at how things in the hip hop and music industry actually work. They give you F me money and then they control you with that money they gave you and the ability to take it away because of the dirt that they have on you. That's the socking truth about Diddy and hip hop. We'll play tomorrow and we'll see you tomorrow. Even all the season, we all wanna be free.